Hey friend, welcome. I'm so excited to have you here listening to another episode of the Pattern Design Circle podcast. Here we talk all about the ins and outs of designing knit and crochet patterns and running a business that makes it all possible. I'm Jessica, your host, knitting pattern designer, design mentor, and the friend in your ear. Can't wait to dive right in. The Pattern Design Circle podcast is sponsored by the Pattern Design Circle a membership community for knit and crochet pattern designers that are feeling lost, lonely, or frustrated in their business. It connects you with a supportive community that's always eager to answer your questions and help you through the hard times. And there's loads of resources and activities specifically catered to business and designing. Sound like your jam? Check it out at snickerdoodleknits.com forward slash design dash circle. That's snickerdoodle like the cookie, knits, K-N-I-T-S dot com forward slash design dash circle. All right, let's get into it. Hello and welcome back to the Pattern Design Circle podcast. I'm so excited to be here in your ear again with a special guest. Today we have Tiffany Staley from the artist JD and she is a lawyer, photographer, a creative. She's also part of the fiber industry as a maker. <laughs> and I have some socks sitting just around behind my computer that I'm working on. So yeah. <laughs> yes. And a small business owner. So it, I'm super excited to have you here. We've talked before inside Pattern Design Circle, the membership, but what I really love is that you totally get creative small businesses. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I think that some of it is just like being immersed in the industry for so long um, and just working with those people as my my sole clients and as my audience. Um, but I also think that like that, you know, my brain has that weird mix of, you know, I like to do creative things, but I also have that like very analytical scientific kind of because I mean, I think we've talked about that my career before I was an attorney was I was a wildlife biologist and I have stories about being licked by bears and tracked by mountain lions and swimming with sharks and all of those fun (laughs) things that like when I do those three as the like, um, which is the truth and the lie, people never guess that the lie is that I tell them the wrong kind of shark that I swam with because (laughs) people just think that those things don't happen to normal people, but somehow they happen to me. Um, So I think some of it is that, that combination. Um, But I also think that like, I'm a pattern spotter. And so I just kind of find patterns and big picture ideas. And when you understand those, then the legal nuances start to make a lot more sense. And so I talk about the big picture stuff and then those little things fall into place, um, which makes sense because that's how a lot of creative brains work. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. And so why did you, how did you find yourself with your business where you're at. Yeah. Um, so um, I actually was working as a wildlife biologist before I went to law school. And I initially came to law school wondering if I was going to do art law or if I was going to do environmental law. Um, I kind of was split between the two. Um, but before law school, I had been um, you know, showing my photography professionally and um, had gotten kind of the reputation as being the person who could explain the law. And I was dating a guy at the time that was an attorney and he, so I would ask him the questions and then I would go and like, be like, Oh, think about it for a little while. And I'd be like, okay, I'm going to tell you a story boyfriend. And is this exact the same thing as what you told me like two days ago about solving this person's problem. And he'd be like, yeah, that's exactly it. And so then I would go and tell the friend the story and they'd be like, Oh, I totally get that. And so at one point he was like, you're the best attorney. I know, like, you know how to like communicate with your clients in a way that understand that they understand you like get the like weird little quirks he's like you just are really good at this um so we made a bet I lost the bet I took the LSATs I did good on the LSATs so he gave me a small little fund of money to apply to law schools I applied to law schools 
I got a full ride scholarship. He said, I told you you had to go to law school. The universe is making this all happen. Go to law school. So I went to law school and um, I knew what environmental attorneys did because I was working with them all the time at my previous job. But I took a job at California Lawyers for the Arts, which is a nonprofit. Um, the, it's a series of nonprofits in a lot of states where they help creatives and artists with their legal problems. <laughs> So my job was basically to answer the phone and talk to an artist and they would explain their legal problem to me. And then we had this network of attorneys that we could reach out to, to say, you know, this is their problem. Are you willing to help them? Um, and became friends with a few of the attorneys and they let me come and sit in when they met with the, you know, the artists as their consults and ended up getting a job at one of those law firms. And it just kind of went from there. So it just was, it was, a. I mean, part of the reason I liked it over some of the environmental stuff is at the end of the day, I make somebody's life better. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. A creative can have peace of mind that I have their back or they can, um, you know, something that's been, they've been worried about or has been nagging them for a long time. I can resolve that issue for them. Whereas I felt like with a lot of the environmental work that I did, like part of the problem was you felt like you made two steps forward here, but then two streets over, they totally bulldozed some beautiful stuff. And so it was like, it always felt like two steps forward and five steps back kind of process. Um, and at the end of the day, yes, maybe you made this one little corner better, but at what other cost kind of thing. And so um, I liked that that personal satisfaction that came with helping people and making them feel better at the end of the day was also really rewarding for me. And being able to help people feel better about legal stuff is really powerful because most of the <laughs> creatives, we, the idea of all the legal stuff, it's just overwhelming. It's confusing. It's all of this jargon that we're not familiar with. And so it feels like, where in the world do you even start? <laughs> yeah. What's actually important? What do I actually need to know? What do I actually take away from this? And, you know, sometimes read a 20 page document. It's like, did I actually, did, am I going to remember anything from this? Did I actually glean anything from this? Or is it just, I, I read the document. So now I can sign <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that there are two, two big camps of creatives. There's the ones of like, I just get overwhelmed. And so I shut down and I don't do anything. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's the camp that feels like they have to have every single little teeny duck in a row before they dare do anything. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think those are the, when it comes to the legal stuff. And then they both stuff, don't do anything. <laughs> yeah. Well, or they, you know, like, well, no, the, the one camp, in my opinion, waste a lot of time and money because they're worried and focused on things that might never matter in their business or might not matter until they hit a certain point. And so I think that, you know, that's kind of why I came up with the legal roadmap framework was because, you know, certain things, I don't want you wasting time on legal tasks. <laughs> There's a handful of legal tasks that everybody needs to do. And once you do those, it really matters what your what your own goals are in your business and what kind of products and services you offer. Because doing certain things are going to be a complete waste of your time if that's not going to help you meet your goals in your business. Um, and so while it's on some small business or small creative business legal checklist that you download, um, it's a waste of your time if it's not going to help you get where you want to go yes yes uh do you have like anything specifically that you see artists doing or creatives doing over and over again regarding legal stuff that just like gets under your skin um so I think that the like the one of the big misconceptions that um sometimes frustrates me is the legal only matters when you get big like nobody's gonna care if I rip off another artist or nobody's gonna care if I do this or don't understand this when I'm small um and in some ways that's true like if an artist comes to me and says this other etsy artist has ripped off my work and i go to their website and i see that they've made five sales and you know do a little digging and it doesn't look like they have many financial resources are we going to pursue it absolutely not because it's going to cost us more than we'll ever be able to get at the end of it 
Um, but the reverse is true. Like you will, as a new beginning artist, you will get, you know, like I have clients who have been given contracts that they don't understand and they sign them and then they're locked in for 20 years to this terrible deal. Um, you know, there's a, a 30 Rock episode where um, Tracy Jordan's character is, um, you know, he's basically is saying that he has to continue to promote Wade Boggs Carpet World every time he goes on a TV show because he signed this terrible contract when he was just first starting out. And so I think that like, in some ways, like there's a core set of tasks that I think everybody needs to do. And once you've done those, then you can not really, you can just focus on those things that are going to help you get pieces in place. Um, but the legal does matter from day one and is really going to help set you up for building a sustainable business. Yes, yes. We, All I'm of those boring things that business coaches want you to do are you know, some of them are there because like having, thinking through some of, you know, like thinking through who your ideal client is, thinking through how your, what your products and services and how, you know, what your profit margins are and all of those kinds of things. Like, yes, it's boring and yes, it's numbers and yes, it's, you know, not the funnest projects, but without that, you're just scattershotting out there and it's really hard to make any steady progress towards your goals. Yes. Yes. Okay. I want to ask you a hot topic question. Uh, what are your thoughts on things online that are offering legal services like legal zoom for small business owners? So I think legal zoom and the equivalent have their place. Um, I think that like for, if you know yourself well enough to know that, Forming a single member LLC, an LLC where you're the only business owner, um, is going to be too overwhelming for you, then LegalZoom is a great solution for you. It's, I think you have to, one caveat with all these services is you have to be very careful what boxes you check and what boxes they check for you, um, because they will, you know, try to encourage you to sign up for. It's not just the whatever, 99, 129, or whatever it is that they're charging right now. Um, you know, they're going to say, oh, you need this thing. And oh, you need that thing. And do you really need all those things? Um, so you have to be careful because sometimes the add-ons that they put on will make it almost as expensive as hiring an attorney to do it for you. Um, so I think like that's a great, that's a great resource um, for those kinds of things. I would strongly encourage you not to use LegalZoom for trademarks. Um, I always say trademarks should be filed by an attorney. There is an art to preparing a trademark application. Um, and like the other day, um, I have a new client that we um, were trying to figure out what her business name is going to be because it's we've done a trademark search and it's a little close to one that's on the register already. And when I opened the application, when we were live on our call, I opened that up and I was like, oh, this is a legal zoom trademark right here. I can tell it's a legal zoom trademark because of how they list out the products and services. There's an art to doing it so that you have the strongest protection possible over the longest time period possible without having to make any changes to it. And legal zoom is a basically some of them now have attorney add-on services where attorneys will review the application for you. Um, but they really are a make it easier to fill out form service. Um, and so if you don't know, you don't know what you don't know. And so if you start going down the road and they're like, yeah, check all of these boxes, you might be actually making it harder on yourself. Yeah, I have heard, and I don't know how common, I've never used it myself. I don't know how common, uh, you know, success versus not success rates are. But I have heard some horror stories of folks who have used legal Zoom and then ended up in yeah, no, territory and, they I mean, did not want to be in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that with trademarks, it makes it really hard. Um, and then like the benefit of having an attorney is again, like there's a whole lot of like, I have hundreds of thousands of client stories over the years of things that they have done wrong in their business or things that have happened that then inform 
every other client that comes after that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, like an attorney, like if you're creating an LLC with a business owner, we're going to ask you a lot of questions and dig into some hard conversations that you might not have had. And you might not have if you go through a service like LegalZoom and they just spit out a standard operating agreement. It might not agree with how you want to deal with in your business and how you want to handle certain kinds of things. Um, so yeah, so it is for very simple legal tasks, like a single member LLC, go for it. For other things, it is probably not in your best interest. And in some cases, it's not going to save you that much money. So since we're talking about contracts in this episode, what yeah. about like template contracts for just general agreements, say between like a dyer and a designer or like on a podcast, like here or agreements like that? So I think that like, so there's kind of two things that I often see go wrong here. Um, one is you buy a template, you get your friend's template, and you maybe have somebody else's, and you Frankenstein them together and turn them into your own contract. Um, those Frankenstein contracts are very obvious to spot because they conflict <laughs> each other, they have the same clause twice, they have like all kinds of information that doesn't make sense. Um, refer to clauses that aren't called those clauses, all of those kinds of things. So if you're going to go that route, um, don't combine them all um, without being very thorough about it. And I guess um, I'll say I there was a, a really big project I was part of that we kind of did that, but then we hired an attorney who actually, then she reviewed the whole thing and was able to uh -huh. say, all right, this is this is messy. Like, so she didn't create it from scratch yeah. for us. We saved a little bit of time there, but then we yeah, we and it was a better situation. And sometimes that actually doesn't save you any time. Okay. I <laughs> often charge people more to review those kinds of contracts than to use my template because my template I know backwards and forwards. I know exactly how it works. I know exactly what goes where. If we're going to talk about, you know, say I want to give you three options around how intellectual property is going to be handled. I know it's three I'm pulling out, you know, mm -hmm. so it's actually mm -hmm. faster for me to base something off my template than to try to figure out how you Frankenstein this contract together and how it conflicts with each other. That makes a lot of sense because I, I had her... I knew about her before I knew about you, so it's nothing against you, <laughs> um, but um, I had bought her templates for a lot of my stuff in business previously, so I'd worked with her. So probably the skeleton of what we had done was that, but then we added mm -hmm. other specifics, so it might yeah. have been more similar to her template, too. Yeah, and sometimes, like, you know, there are a handful of templates that people come to me all the time that want me to review that they've Frankenstein. And I'll say, if it really is, like until I see it, I can't give you a firm mm -hmm. quote, but if it really is primarily based off that template, then I have enough familiarity with it at this point mm -hmm. in time that it doesn't take me quite as long. Um, but sometimes they Frankenstein them so much. It's just, <laughs> oh my goodness, what have you done? This is you just created so much. Sometimes I just scan through them and I'm like, nope, this is going to take you far longer than from me starting from scratch. Like, I don't know what you did here. So you, um, I interjected you. You said that was scenario one, was people Frankenstein. Yeah. So, and scenario two is that you buy them from somebody who doesn't actually understand the industry. Mm -hmm. Um. You know, like there are, there are people out there who I've seen their templates and they're some of them are great and some of them are not great. Um, but if you are buying them and they don't actually understand the industry, they might have some like non-standard industry practices in there. They might have certain things in there that aren't relevant or are missing. Um, and so, you know, that being said, it's hard to find an attorney who actually understands the industries. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, sometimes those are better than going to just, you know, somebody who does small business law, but doesn't actually get, you know, pattern design um, and how a designer works with a tech editor. If they don't get that relationship, then it's really going to be hard for them to craft a perfect agreement either. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, uh, 
there was a, a friend I had many years ago that used to say, like, you don't go to a podiatrist for a boob job. Um, and so if you're going to hire an attorney or you're going to buy a template, you want to make sure that you're buying them from somebody who actually understands your industry and what you're trying to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, and again, sometimes what I see people charging for these templates, not that much cheaper than what it costs me to customize my <laughs> template for you. <laughs> um, you know, like I, I sometimes am appalled by what the pricing is for people to buy a template versus having an attorney prepare it for you. Yes. Yes. Okay. So let's talk specifically contracts agreements. Yeah. Why are they important to start with? So contracts get a really bad rap. (laughs) Um, And I think that that's because the perception of why a contract exists is because people think they're there to prevent you from getting screwed over. Mm -hmm. And they're not. Um, I want you to flip your mindset around contracts and Think of them as a gift you're giving to the other side. You're presenting a contract because you don't want to unintentionally disappoint the person you're working with because you're on different pages about what's going on. And so I like to say contracts get everybody on the same page by literally getting everybody on the same page. Mm -hmm. Um, We're going to present this contract not as a like I'm lording over you or I don't trust you or I think you're going to take advantage of me, but as a hey, I want our relationship to be successful. I want us both to walk away with this, feeling really proud about what we did. And in order for us not to, me not to unintentionally disappoint you and you not to unintentionally disappoint me, I just wanna write this little email that's got some bullets of like, this is how I see our relationship progressing. Are we on the same page? Guess what? They hit reply and say yes, We have a written contract because a contract only needs three things to be valid. It needs an offer, it needs an acceptance of that exact offer, and it needs a promise to exchange things of value. That's all a contract needs. It doesn't need to be 20 pages, doesn't need to be stuffed with legal jargon. It can be an email, it can be um, a text message conversation, it can be an Instagram conversation it doesn't have to be big and formal yeah um that is you know like I've I've heard that that's all you need legally to be able to back it up uh I am kind of curious I guess my initial thought and so I'm curious to hear your your response is um I feel like sometimes people maybe take that agreement more seriously and actually follow through in it if there's like a signature on it do you feel like that is a thing Um, I think that there's definitely some value to it um but if I mean it also depends on the dollar amount involved Mm -hmm. you know like and, and the risk involved you know there is a reason we have a more formal contract process when we're talking about more formal long standing kind of relationships long standing things where there's a bot, bit of money and a bit of risk and a bit of those kinds of things like in those cases yes let's get it formalized let's you know um you use a service like dropbox sign um you know, Google, um, if you have Google Workspace, they now have an e-signature platform um, incorporated into it where you can send signatures. So all you have to do is send the document and then somebody can just stick their signature on it and it's done. Um, So I think there are instances where people do take it more seriously when they put their electronic um, or pen signature on something. Um, But I think that Um, For certain relationships and certain kinds of projects, making it more formal actually riles up the other Mm -hmm. side um, and can make it less likely that the relationship is going to progress. So you really have to like figure out for this kind of project and this kind of relationship, is an email better um, or is something more formal better? Yeah, yeah. Because I guess I'm thinking especially of relationships between a designer and a dyer uh, because I've done quite a lot of that and uh, honestly actually most of it wasn't like a, 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 a it was all agreement via email 
Um, right. mm-hmm. um, and, you know, there are some scenarios where we go back and forth 300 times. That's maybe a slight exaggeration, but there's lots of emails. And so then for each party to remember the specifics, it gets more difficult. Um, yeah. Then maybe sometimes you think you talked about something and we're clear about something. And then when it comes to the actual culmination of the project, it doesn't happen. Uh, so I think uh, an actual agreement is really helpful there. And at the same time, I also think, I, I know for myself, even like if somebody is, you know, sticks in our industry specifically, sticks a really legal looking document in front of me and is like, hey, we need to do this before we do anything else. I can't talk to you until, you know, then I'm like, it is a little bit off-putting. It's like, yeah. Um, well, I kind of like, I, I would like to have like a, a nice friendly kind of relationship with the people that I work with and like, don't want to feel like it's a super. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I think that like, again, there's that, like that, you know, play and that reading that emotional intelligence kind of factor that comes into it of what is going to be best in this situation. And, you know, in the situation of that, you mentioned of like going back and forth with the dyer a bunch of times, like. At a certain point, it would it's good to just say like, okay, we've gone back and forth on these five things several times. Like, I just want to make sure that like the like here's an email that's bulleted. Here's those five decisions all spaced out. Are we in agreement here? Um, and so like even in those, just having those like little check ins. So then we just add additional bullets as we agree to things. But every handful of emails, we just let's summarize, this is where, where I think we are. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, and if you don't agree, you know, if you agree, hit reply and say yes. If you don't let me know, because I'm just trying to make sure, you know, and you can always do it in a, like, I want to make sure I'm holding up, like, Yep. I'm not letting you down by doing something wrong. That something it's just that communicating yeah, so that we're just communicating. on the same page. <laughs> that's all it is, is we're communicating and getting everybody on the same page. And I don't want to let you down. I don't want you to let me down because we aren't actually on the same page. So in those back and forths, just inserting every once in a while, bulleted, okay, this is where I think we are on all of our decisions. Are we in agreement? And I found pretty early on that it helped significantly to be on the same page. If I, when I brought my collaboration idea from the beginning to just share my, my expectations, how my collaborations usually work, this is, and then it help, does help move a bunch of that back and forth because it's like, all right, here's where I'm coming from. They can, you know, state where they're coming from. And it's a much faster resolution process. Almost definitely. And I think also like it, helps you weed out people who aren't going to be a good fit mm-hmm. from the very beginning of like, this is what I need. And if that dyer can't provide that, then right up front, they're able to say like, nope, sorry, not going to be able to do that. Because then you've just saved yourself a whole host of emails and how many weeks of back and forth to find out they can't do what you know, at minimum, you need done. <sighs> Yes, yes. So how about when we have a really solid working relationship with other people and maybe they're friends? Do we still need an agreement then? Yes, you do. <laughs> um, and, you know, again, um, you know, sometimes with friends, it's even worse um, because, you know, we sometimes assume both in business and in personal life that our friends are going to act and think the same way we do. And our friends don't always do that. (laughs) Um, And so, you know, it can actually help your friendship by having the conversation. Um, Several years ago, I worked with two women who ran a business together and they came to me to kind of, they had this new contract that they were going to embark on a new partnership in their business. And they wanted me to review the contract and make sure, help them negotiate it, make sure that it was really going to help them. Them move their business forward and they weren't going to be taken advantage of. And so we have the kickoff meeting and, you know, I've read through the contract and I have a whole bunch of questions for them to ask about them and um, some questions about the larger picture of their goals in their business and how this fit in with that. And the answers I got back from the business owners, there was agreement on some things, but disagreement on like core things um, about how they would execute the vision of their business. Um, And those two executions could not live side by side in their businesses. 
And so I had to have the hard conversation of pointing out that I didn't quite understand how these could live in the same business. Um, and they were at first taken a little back, but then over the next several weeks had some more hard conversations and came to an agreement that their ideas couldn't, their execution couldn't live together in the same business. Mm -hmm. um, so they decided to go their separate ways. We did a business kind of divorce for them. Um, and both of them afterwards ended up sending me thank you cards of like, you actually saved our friendship because we were feeling some tension. We were feeling like one of us was always sacrificing our execution for the other. Um, and so they're still friends now and they still, you know, their kids are the same age and they still do all kinds of things together. They, I just saw pictures of them on vacation together a couple weeks on Instagram. Um, but they wouldn't be there in their friendship if they didn't have the hard conversations. Um, and, you know, and so having those conversations and making sure that even with friends or acquaintances that you are actually on the same page um, can really make it so that you stay friends in the long term. Yes. And just like how collaboration in general, one of the most important things, relationships in general, one of the most important things oh, yeah. is communication. I mean, this, is a, this is a small <laughs> industry. You do not want to get the reputation of, you know, being someone who, you know, you know, has unrealistic or like what the design, you know, dyers think is an unrealistic expectation of what they're going to do and never communicates that to them. They, they don't find out until the very end and you're unhappy with their work, you know? And so, you know, all industries are small, but our industry in particular is even smaller. And, you know, and so making sure that you're having relationships, because again, once you work with somebody, like you have a shorthand for like, okay, this worked really well last time. This didn't work really well last time. How can we fix this part of it next time? Mm -hmm. Okay, then we can pivot on that the next time. And so like, you know, being able to have long-term relationships helps everybody's businesses succeed um, and helps lift everybody up. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and so you had mentioned that I could maybe touch on why well, okay. So we, we have worked together. This is our second time now <laughs> having a conversation together. First of all, was in pattern design circle, the membership and now on the podcast. And so you had mentioned that, you know, I had sent a contract for both the initial and now a follow-up for the second. And, um, I will admit that my, you know, my first thought is, well, then I'm protected for both of them. <laughs> um, <laughs> that you like legally the first the first contract doesn't apply at all to anything that happens outside of that contract and so to make sure that i'm covered if if something were to come up but you to the point of what we've actually been talking about there they're different agreements what we're actually where the content is being shared the compensation for the content all of those things are very different and so to have Make sure that those expectations are really outlined and that the there is an agreement that mm -hmm. what we're doing is is different. And this is what yeah. is happening with this scenario instead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that um, I will say like, you know, I appear on a lot of podcasts and podcast guest agreement. I've been pushing for them for a long time. And I actually for many years, my pitch, part of my pitch was when I was when I pitched podcasts was I will give you my templates to use with me and future guests. Um, if you if you invite me on your podcast, I'll just I'll give you my template. Um, and so I got on a lot of podcasts in the beginning by like being like, hey, do you want my template? All you have to do is bring me on as a guest to talk about legal stuff and I'll give you my template. Um, but it's becoming more, I think, you know, it's becoming more and more common that people are sending them. Um, and I think it's, again, really important to like every podcast has a different style and a different like, how much education do you want? How much storytelling do you want? Um, do you just want to talk about shiny things? Do you want to talk about not so shiny things? Do you, um, you know, what are the expectations around promotion and pitching your own, you know, what 
post promotion the guests are supposed to be doing and um, how much the guests can be pitching on the podcast. Um, and so I think that, again, there's a lot of areas ripe for misunderstanding um, mm -hmm. if you don't have an agreement. And so I think that, again, it goes back to the core of why we're putting contracts in front of people um, no matter what. And we're putting contracts in front of people to prevent misunderstandings and to make sure everybody's on the same page. Yes. And it was interesting because we were we were kind of talking about, you know, what are we actually going to talk about on this episode and contracts, yada, yada. And I had in, in the interim of when we were talking, I received a message, an email from another podcaster that I had invited as a guest and sent the, the agreement and everything. And her response was, I'm actually just impressed that you've got a clear agreement. It's good to know what to expect. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, that perfectly explains exactly why this is here. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so yeah, so um, you're brave enough to say that you wanted me to audit your agreement. <laughs> yes, so, I, have, I you know, it is a little bit nerve wracking, I will admit. Uh, I, and so, I have not told her what I'm going to say, except for one thing. We did discuss one thing this morning, but yes. Which is not surprising. <laughs> yeah. I know that it's going to be, I'll try to not, you know, be defensive and be like, well, I'm doing this because. <laughs> um, no, and I mean, I don't, so I will say like, overall, it's great. Um, well, I first of all, can we, I'll say my actual contracts with guests are not, they're pretty casual, I feel like. Mm -hmm. um, and they're definitely not from a template. They're just something that I wrote up. So <laughs> yeah, no, and and that's that's where we're missing some things. Is you just wrote it up and you didn't steal some language from a template. Um, so uh, you know, one thing I like to do with contracts is have what's called a cover page, and then the legal fine print. Um, and so I think what you have right now is those kind of first little bit is like the perfect cover page of like, these are my expectations. This is what I um, need from you. This is the tone of the podcast. This is what we like to talk about. This is the expectations on you, those kinds of things. Um, I think that's great as a cover page. Mm -hmm. um, and then I often insert the signatures right there on the cover page um, because in a perfect scenario, um, and this applies to every contract I write. So don't think, oh, I don't have a podcast. I can stop tuning out right now <laughs> um, because the, the things that I'm going to talk about, many of them you all are going to need in your contract. So don't <laughs> jump off right now. Um, I promise it's worth it sticking around for the last little bit. <laughs> Um, so, um, the cover page in a perfect scenario, I like to see the cover page being the only thing that we ever look at. Um, it's those things that are necessary for a smooth working relationship. Um, so, um, I would say maybe the only thing that's missing on here is like, um, do you need a headshot from me? Do you need a bio from me? Do you need any of these things and how do I get them to you? Um, so like on that cover page, I like to, um, put those things that are necessary for a smooth working relationship. So what the expectations are, what deliverables I need from you, what those kinds of things. And then, you know, in, in other contracts, we have things like what the payment is and what copyright ownership are and some of those kinds of things with other kinds of contracts. Um, so I would say that might be missing from the cover page, um, is, what materials you need from your guests. Um, and then I often have, again, have that signature right there on that front page. And we only have to turn to that legal fine print in any contract if that's not perfectly smooth. And then we turn to the, how do we deal with things when mm -hmm. it's not perfectly smooth? Or if I want more information, what do I do? Um, and my podcast um, template, agreement template, is only two pages. It's that cover page, and then it's the legal fine print that I have as just, I think it's one through 10 or one through 12 kind of um, bulleted, you know, numbered list of, of those kinds of things. Um, 
So another thing that um, is important anytime you are having somebody on your podcast, anytime you're taking photographs of somebody and using them on your Instagram account, anytime you are using someone's name or likeness, um, there's a set of laws that are called right of publicity. And that's our ability as individuals to control how our name, our likeness, our photograph, any of our biographical information can be used to promote somebody else's products or services. Um, and so um, this often kind of is conjoined with a model release sometimes for photographs. Um, and it is the right for me to say, um, it's okay for you to use my name to promote your podcast. Um, and so a um, release that allows you to use my name and my photograph um, would be a nice addition to your contract. Um, again, if you are working with somebody who maybe you're doing a collaboration with a brand, a dyer, and you wanna use the dyer's background, as part of this co-release, you're going to need that release to say it's okay for both of us to use the information of the founder or the individual um, to promote this product or service. Um, so another, not that many, I don't have that many. You're okay. <laughs> um, so then there was also just the things that like, as a guest, I was reading through and we're like, hmm, I don't know how I'm supposed to handle this. Like, what would have happened if I had an emergency this morning? The dog was throwing up. I had an emergency. I couldn't show up. I don't have a phone number to call you at. I don't have, you know, those kinds of things. So like last minute changes, reschedules, how do you want those? And it, it's not necessarily that like, again, just how do you want them to happen? Like, mm -hmm. what's it gonna make it so that we don't have to have quite so much back and forth? Um, another thing that, I, and this is just coming from like, you know, obviously being a podcast guest and seeing a lot of contracts, a lot more contracts now are putting in their expectations of promotions for the guest. Um, this is something that's being pulled from brand partnership contracts. That is much very popular these days in brand partnership contracts of what are the expectations? If I'm your affiliate, if I have a relationship with you and I'm helping sell your products in exchange for either a flat rate or a per um, sale on a per sale basis, what are the expectations around when and how I'm promoting this thing? Um, so if you have certain expectations about how I'm supposed to be promoting it, it would be good to lay those out <laughs> so that I get, I'm not unintentionally disappointing you by you thinking I'm going to shoot it out to my email list, but I don't know you're expecting that. Yes, this is actually, I want to insert this something for the folks listening because it can be really easy when you're first starting something and you're first asking for gas uh, to be scared to put your expectations out there, to feel like people are going to say no if you're asking too much. Um, and well, there, there is some element of building up some credibility to know that like, all right, people know that this is actually a fair agreement. Uh, but then the reason I'm saying this is because when the agreement was first created, I, I had no idea really what my expectations were. I still am extremely loose, which is why they're not in there. But now I have the confidence of like, oh yeah, I could definitely put in some things and it would boost the podcast more. It would, you know, all of that kind of thing. Well, and again, going back to the conversation we were having about like presenting what you need for a collaboration up front, like saying like, this is only worth my time. If you can do like mm -hmm. this, then if they can't do this, then it's a waste of everybody's time. Mm -hmm. And so we're actually, again, by putting our boundaries and expectations up front, then we're making it so that we're weeding out relationships that aren't going to help either of us because if you know if we can't if they can't help us and we can't help them then it's not a successful relationship it's not building a long-term relationship and so it's better to now realize that than 
two months from now when we're like, okay, I just spent all this time and energy and effort putting this podcast out and they are like gone at this point, you know? (laughs) And so. Yeah. um, And I think what I was getting at is also just like, it's okay to increase your expectations. Like at the beginning, it's like, all right, maybe I'm, it's, I'm not quite confident enough to make the bigger ask, but at some point you can increase, you can change, you can change your, and Mm -hmm. ask for more. And that's, and honestly, like asking for a share on social, not that hard. And it also like, as, as a guest, like it also is then like, okay, then that's a content idea. I don't have to come up with. I just know when that podcast comes out that I've got like three things that already are handled. They're going to give me the promotion graphics. They're going to give me this and that. And all I have to do is share it and easy, easy peasy done. You know, it also helps the other person that you're working with again, know how things are going to proceed. I love that um, kind of reframing. It's easy for us to think about how things are going to benefit us, but also think about how they benefit the other person. You know, when you're talking about promotion, like, you know, it could be easy to feel like, oh, now I'm asking them to promote my stuff where, like you said, they might be like, oh, now this helps take care of my marketing for a week. Like, Mm -hmm. like, (laughs) it actually makes my life easier. (laughs) So, and that's actually, you hit on the number one contract negotiation tip. Number one contract negotiation tip is figure out how to frame what's good for you as good for them. Yeah. Period. If you can figure out a way to frame something that's good for you as also good for them, you have won every negotiation. I, yes, so much. I feel we could end the podcast right there. That's like mic drop right there. (laughs) I am writing down that quote. (laughs) Uh, Okay, you can continue with your your audit. (laughs) Um, Let's see, what haven't we talked about? Um, So this one, I didn't... um, you don't really have a clear statement that you own the copyright in the recording. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I know because I'm an IP attorney that you own the copyright in the court recording, Um, but it's probably a good idea to make that clear to other people Mm -hmm. again. And again, this is on your page two. We've got, you know, five or 10 like little bulleted items of like, these are, if these things happen, then this is the further information. Um, and the second part of that is kind of a little more, uh, relevant to, um, the community one rather than the podcast itself. Um, if you, the other person is sharing materials with you. So like, uh, you're working on a collaboration and they are bringing some pre-existing materials into the collaboration, um, or they're appearing as an excuse me, expert in your community and are bringing slides or bringing other materials they've already created. You want a license to be able to use their materials on a non-exclusive basis inside um, whatever the final output is. Yeah. Um, So those are kind of the the big picture ones. other than the one we talked about this morning. Um, So this morning I got an email from Jessica being like, hey, by the way, you've never signed the podcast agreement. And I was like, oh, that's funny because I was just thinking this morning when I was making my little notes, cheat sheet about what I was gonna talk to you about is that um, another really amazing thing for those, if you're doing the more formal contract is to use an a service that will send the contract and let them insert their signature electronically. Um, I do this for all my client contracts. I do this for all my, anytime I have a guest come inside my community, um, because A, they will send the reminder letters for you if the person hasn't done it and you don't have to take the time out. Um, B, it then auto sends both of you once the signatures are done, here's the signed version um, and makes it really easy, um, easy for them to sign. Um, So like, For yours, I uploaded it to my service and then I inserted my signature and it would have, anytime you can make it an easy yes, um, it just 
again, reduces that resistance of having the person put their signature on the page. Um, so like I said, Dropbox sign, if you have a Dropbox account, you now get free unlimited signatures since Dropbox bought Hello Sign, um, and it's integrated into their platform, unlimited signatures. And then um, Google Workspace now has an e-signature tool as well. So if you pay for a Google workspace account, you have that in yours as well, and you can use it there. So it's not going to cost you any more money. And hopefully it's one that's already integrated with um, a service that you use. And so it makes your life super simple too. You can just add it to your SOP of like, okay, once so-and-so is agreed, shoot it over and then we're done. Um, yeah, again, that's really great to hear because I know when I've looked into stuff before, the reason I haven't used it is because of the expense associated mm -hmm. with it so yeah, yeah. <laughs> um so yeah so both google and dropbox now have integrated services that um as long as you're on the right i mean i think the dropbox you have to have a business account like a business plan it's not like on their personal plan but it's on their business plan and google it's workspace so that's again business mm -hmm. yeah perfect um, so yeah, so those are, those are kind of some, some thoughts. Um, <laughs> thank you for, for sharing. I definitely took plenty of notes while you were chatting. <laughs> but, and again, many of these things are relevant. The format of your contract, that's something that I teach over and over again of having that cover page, um, and having that as the, like, these are the things that the other side cares about. It makes it easy to find. It makes it easy for you to update because only those things on that first page change. Those things in the legal fine print don't change from time to time. So it makes it less likely that you're going to say, send out the wrong copyright license um, that you don't really want to send out. Um, it makes it easier for you. Um, and then, you know, it also from a like, somebody getting the contract, it also feels very like inviting and like, oh, those are easy. And then this fine print, I don't really have to care about. It's just, just this stuff. Okay. No big deal. Yes. Um, is dispute resolution stuff, is that important to include in um, so I include dispute resolution in like collaboration contracts. I include them in um, longer term relationship contracts. I don't really include them in guest agreement kind of contracts, just because it's mostly a one and done kind of situation. Um, at most, what I include in those is um, like a, an indemnity clause the like if you come on my podcast and like defame somebody or you know and somebody tries to drag me into it then um, an indemnity provision what that does is basically the it's the fancy legal way of saying that you're gonna stand in my shoes so if um, you know, I came on and defamed somebody, which I wouldn't do on Jessica's podcast. Jessica could be like, okay, Tiffany, you have to defend this lawsuit of this person suing me over what you said on my podcast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but because, you know, dispute resolutions usually are like a mediation or arbitration provision, say we're not going to go to court. Um, for one-off kind of situations, the likelihood of that coming about is pretty slim. So it's not something that I prioritize in those kinds of contracts. I mean, every contract we could turn into 20 pages and have all kinds of crazy scenarios, but we don't want to. Um, we want to include those most likely things. Um, and so that's why I don't include it in a, but in a like collaboration or a client contract or those kinds of things, then yes, um, I would do that. Yes. Uh, so do you, you've, you've mentioned your own templates. Do you have yes. those available for people to purchase or are those just what you work off of? Um, so uh, my, my personal law firm bank of templates is just for me um, mostly. And I've taken some of those and I sell them through the artist courtyard, um, both um, if you 
join as a member for $45 a month, you get access to the entire library of contract templates, or you can buy if you're not everyone wants a reoccurring monthly membership. And so if you just want to buy a standalone template, then you can buy those. Um, they are all less than $500. I don't charge a ton for them because again, I feel like if you're going to pay a lot, you should have a personalized one. <laughs> Um, so there are the artistcourtyard.com. There are some available there. Um, the reason I don't make my personal templates available is because they're too confusing for people. Um, <laughs> like I, mine are like 30 pages long with like all the scenarios mm -hmm. and I just make a copy and delete, 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 delete. Um, and just know which of the like 12 copyright options I'm picking. Um, but it just would be overwhelming to anybody but me. Um, so yeah, so my personal ones aren't available, but there are some available um, through the artist courtyard. Yes. And then I know you have a couple of books. How do those I relate do. to uh, creative business owners? Yeah. So um, I mentioned that I created the legal roadmap, which is kind of your guide to having a strategy to be able to protect your assets without legal confusion. Um, and that book is, you can buy it on Amazon or you can go to legalroadmapbook.com and you can get that. Um, and it will kind of help you um, tackle kind of three different things that'll help you um, create a uh, kind of a one sheet plan that you'll use to guide all your decisions in your business, both legal and otherwise. It will help you take care of five, six must do legal tasks. And then we'll help you create a personalized legal to do list that only are those items that will help you grow your business. <laughs> Um, and then I also, if you're looking to create an LLC, I have a book that walks you step by step through the process of how to do it and how to maintain it in the long run. Um, and that can be used in conjunction with a site like Legal Zoom or um, my preferred one is Northwest Registered Agents, only because they're a privacy first company. Um, and so they let you use their address and keep your information out of public databases. Um, so uh, I tend to refer people. They are who I use as my LLC's registered agent um, and all my clients. Um, but if you're not sure, you're like, I don't know, Tiffany, what I'm supposed to do next. If you go to nextlegalstep.com. Um, I have a quiz, a video quiz um, there, and you'll answer some questions and then um, you'll get an answer of what your best next legal step is. And then um, within, I usually try to, within two business days, we'll look at your answers and then I provide you a personal video response with like, here's some more information, here's based on what you wrote, what I think your best next step is, um, in addition to like the auto <laughs> conditional logic thing that I put together um, so that you can kind of get some more information about um, where your time is best used. That's, I really love that. I mean, I love that it's a resource to start with, but that you have the personal feedback part too, because it can be so often as a business owner, it's like, well, did that, did I answer that question right? Or did that actually apply right? Or, you know, there can still be some hesitancy where when you add the actual personalization to be like, yeah, I see you. This is what's going on. Yes. Yes. So, um, so yeah. So sometimes depending upon the day, it might take me a couple days to get back because some, some mornings I wake up and I have a whole list of them to do. Um, but other mornings it's like only one or two and it doesn't take very long. Um, so yeah, so it just, and then, you know, just normal life things of like, oh, I have a deliverable due today. And so I don't have as much time to spend on them. Um, but yeah, but I, I get back to people within a few days, usually. That's so wonderful. Thank you so much for everything that you have shared for the resources that you just dropped. Um, <laughs> is there anything else that you would like to share with small business owners with regards to legal stuff or contracts just in general? Or I mean, that was mixed up. That was the opposite. But yes, either one. Yes. Yeah, so really <laughs> I think, you know, I think again, like it's important to, you know, just like I wanted you to reframe contracts as a gift, like start to think about reframing some of these scary legal things as 
um, as gifts or as things that you're doing that, you know, like I started weight training again this winter and sometimes doing hard things today makes things easier tomorrow. And so how can we um, take small, teeny steps, bites out of the elephant? Like what's that teeny tiny task you can take today that's going to make some of this easier tomorrow? Um, because, you know, I know the legal stuff can be overwhelming. I know that you have a gazillion questions and we've just touched on this teeny tiny little corner today. Um, and so, you know, taking it one step at a time, not trying to do everything at once, making sure that it's helping you meet your goals, not my goals, not Jessica's goals, not anybody else's goals for your business, your own goals. That's why we run our own businesses is to <laughs> have the life we want, not have the life everybody else wants. So if an expert's thing is not going to help you reach your goals, then you can ignore that expert's opinion. Um, and so, you know, take those small steps, reframe things so that they help you and, um, you know, and do hard things because we can do hard things and they make things easier in the long run. Beautiful. Thank you again so much for joining no us problem. for everything that you've shared. Um, be sure to, if you're listening, check out the links in the description, the show notes. And if you're a member of the Pattern Design Circle membership, if you haven't watched our guest episode with Tiffany, it's all about copyright and trademark. Go check it out. There's so much value there. If you're not a member and you've been thinking about it, if you join, you'll have access as well. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Wow. Thanks so much for listening to this episode. If you found it valuable, please share the podcast with a designer friend. And if you have a minute, leave a review. It's so helpful for me and means the world to me. Chat soon.